Hello, Katrine. And Martina is with us. Hi, guys. Hi, Sharon. How are you? Fine. And how are you? Good, good. Ah, there she is. Nice to meet you. Oops, I, you're on mute. I can. There you can go. You, yeah, can perfect. you hear me now? Yes, okay. I can. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today. And I'll, I'll welcome you once our whole group gets on. Do you have any questions for, for me before we get started? Uh, uh, I was not sure. Should I intend the whole meeting or do I just leave uh, after my part? Um, you know, you're more than welcome to, to listen in if you um, find it interesting. Uh, what I usually do on the agenda is, is just work our way through some of the uh, reports um, and uh, uh, and then uh, what we're doing with marketing and going to conferences. So, I mean, there's there's no secrets. It's just, you know, it's just whether you're interested or not to hear. Yeah, it might um, be interesting. I'll see then. If, if, I were, if I'm welcome, I'll see um, if I can stay a bit longer. Yeah, yeah, you're more than welcome. That's great. And I'm so glad that you're able to do this for us because we have been, you know, looking at different models and, and just seeing how to... Um, kind of make sure we're communicating across this whole <laughs> expanse of development here and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, so yes. we're struggling with those things. <laughs> Situation with COHA is a bit different, of course, but maybe you can pick up some things. I hope it will be exactly. helpful in some way to, to foster discussion. And, yeah. Absolutely. I, I think you can learn from everybody. Um, there's always this bright light of like, oh, yeah, why? We, we should try this or um, maybe we could do this a little differently, take that idea and do it a little differently or whatever. So, yeah. So where are you located, Katrina? Uh, we are in Constance, which is uh, near the Lake of Constance or right at the Lake of Constance, very much in the south at the Swiss mm. border. Oh, at the Swiss border. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You, can just, you can just walk over to Switzerland, which uh, oh, that's my cool. guests like to do. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's very cool. Um, we, uh, I just got back from a, a vacation and we took a biking vac vacation. So we started in the Czech Republic and then we went over to Germany and Passau and then went over into um uh, Austria and then up to mm -hmm. Vienna. So that's how we, we started in Prague and ended up in Vienna. Mm -hmm. So yeah, crossing those borders, we had fun doing that. It was like, <laughs> oh, cause in the U S it's like state to state, big deal, you know, but <laughs> to another, <laughs> another whole country is. <laughs> Actually, the, the interesting bit about the lake is that there's Austria, um, Germany and Switzerland bordering on it. So oh. somewhere in the lake, there is a point where the, all, all those three meet, but we don't know where. <laughs> that is so cool. You're right. <laughs> I love that geography. That's great. I have to go there too <laughs> one day. Uh, there <laughs> you go. The... No, welcome. <laughs> so, um, Sharon? Yes. Uh, can we get the recording, um, a link to the recording or from from today's meeting? Because uh, I have a call, a, a, some colleagues here who would like to listen to. Oh, Google. that's a great idea. And you know what I should do is um, get the link and we can put it right in the minutes. And I will also put it on our wiki page as a resource. That's a great idea. Okay. So mm. I, I see the recording sign. So. Yeah. Yep. And we record every meeting. So, but <laughs> I don't always put the links in. So I've got to learn to do that. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that reminder. Well, it's a special occasion today. Yes, so. it is. It is. Now I'm, now I'm a little bit more scared than I was <laughs> no, before. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> it's fun to have guests with us. To, it's really fun. So we have some people signing on. Hi, Dracine and Deborah and uh, Sebastian, did you get my agenda this week? 
you know, I don't think that I have seen it. Oh, darn. I added you to the list and then, okay. I just sent it out like um, yesterday. Okay. Let me have a look. But I, I don't believe so. I think I would have noticed. And Katrine, I, I, I um, copied you on the agenda, right? Yes, I received yeah. it. Good. Excellent. Is the audio okay? Are you hearing me well? Yeah, and we're hearing the sirens too. Is that yours? <laughs> no, no, not mine. Not you. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hello, Hi, Harry. Hi, Harry. Hi, everybody. Can can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can, yeah. Kirsten. Okay. Hi. <laughs> Hi, thank you for joining us on your vacation. Yeah, I, I don't have a camera here, because, but um, I think it will work. <laughs> uh, well, we can hear you, so that's good. That's good. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm very excited to hear from Katri Katrin. <laughs> yeah. You've all heard it before, I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not us, not us, Katrin. No, 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 no. <laughs> I haven't. <laughs> I'll wait for a few more minutes because I think we have Kristen Martin yep, coming. I'm here. Oh, you're here. Yay. Okay. I'm late, but I'm not that late. No, you're not. Yeah. You're not. <laughs> Sharon, Sharon's just running a type ship today. It's like a little bit. Well, it's 8, 8 31. So. <laughs> Let's see. Um, Hi, Rachel. Hello. And, and Holly's here. And I'm hoping Michael will jump in too. Hi, Peter. Good morning. Good. And Tanya's here. Excellent. I hear that Michael's not feeling well, so I'm not sure if he's going to call in. Yeah, that's true. I was I was hoping he would just because of um, all the the activity that happened in Boston. So we want it would be nice to get a summary. Hi, Paula. Okay. So. Oh, sorry. I was hi. Hi. Oh, no problem. <laughs> Okay, so we'll just get started since uh, we have Katrine with us today. And I first want to uh, thank um, uh, Debbie for agreeing to do minutes and then Kirsten for uh, getting us um, in touch with Katrine to give us an overview today. So welcome Katrine. And we were gonna start right off with you and giving us uh, a little bit about yourself and then um, uh, what you'd like to tell us about the COHA organization and governance. And that's uh, <laughs> really important to us. So, so thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. Um, how do I start? Um, I'm working at BSZ, which is similar to HPZ and GBW. We are library service centers. Um, we are actually have a close cooperation with Kirsten from uh, GBW. So that's uh, one reason why we know each other. Um, I'm a librarian uh, by education, working as an IT coordinator, also dabbling a bit in computer science. So I, yeah. <laughs> I know a lot of things, but not nearly enough. Um, I got involved in uh, Koha, the Koha community around 2000, end of 2008, 2009. I was originally hired to migrate libraries to Symphony, which uh, well was called Corinthian then, turned out into Symphony because Corinthian was never released. So we had time to uh, investigate open source solutions and that's how we came to be a Koha support provider. Um, I think I'm going to share my screen with you. Excellent. I hope it works. Okay. 
So I've prepared some slides. Um, I'll start with a bit of history because history explains a lot about why the Koha community does things in a certain way. Um, oh, one second. No. Oh, we can see it. Perfect. We can see your slides. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And that's actually clicking works now too. Okay. We'll start in um, 1999, which is the year Koha started. At this time, Horofino Library Trust, um, HLT in New Zealand, had uh, was using a proprietary ILS that had known Y2K bugs. But since the um, the original company had gone out of business, they couldn't fix it. It was proprietary, so they couldn't change the code. Um, they did an RFP process, which they came up empty-handed. Um, and they decided to contract Katipu Communications uh, for development of a new ILS. One of the developers is known to have said, how hard can it be? <laughs> yes, it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> but it's kind of like the Kiwi spirit to say it will be fine and to believe it. It's not the German way of doing things. Um, so um, they started with limited, fu limited functional requirements. Um, so there was no mark in the original uh, core version, but there was a Ferber database scheme or Ferber's related database scheme that later was given up when Mark was introduced and there was no serials model. Um, there were three developers, one full-time, two part-time, and they finished the initial version in three months. Um, they did it by going to the library, watching the librarians sitting behind the circulation desk, watching what they did with the existing system, asking questions, then they went to write code, then they came back. Often they had to redo what they did and ended up with a version that was working for the library and they managed to go live in on 1st January um, before the Y2K bug um, could bite them. Um, I think it's remarkable that the first version of Koha was already web-based, which is now the normal, but this was year 2000. Um, it was, as far as we know, the first open source or free software ILS at all. And at the same year, we, uh, there were already two first contributors outside of KTP Communications. Um, there was a short time of uh, development. I'm not sure if they'd do it again. <laughs> but we are very lucky that the very first de full-time developer, Chris Cormack, is still with us uh, as of today. And Horofino Library Trust is also using Koha as of today. It's not the same library. They have, are using RFID now. They have a new building, but they're using still the same software that has evolved with them. Um, after the first contributors from outside came in, you needed a bit of structure. So um, in 2002 to 2005, um, there were the first elected release teams. Some infrastructure was set up. We have a bugzilla for bug, tra bug tracking, which is uh, open. We started the first wiki. Um, to gather communication. Um, some enhancements were made. The list could be much longer. The most remarkable ones are another new acquisitions model, uh, enhanced uh, reporting, and the ability to translate uh, the whole application, as there were soon uh, also contributors from outside uh, the English-speaking countries. And Mark support was added from the beginning to work with Unimark as well with Mark 21. You have to choose, but both uh, flavors are fully supported. At the moment, we also support Normark, which is the Norwegian version of Mark. Um, um, here, I wanted to, <laughs> to do a big little excursion to show the release team for the next version, which will be released in uh, November, um, to show the different roles that we have in the community. Um, first of all, we have the release manager, um, who is currently Jonathan Trotardois, the Belgian who lives in Argentina. Um, we have release manager assistants. In case of he goes on vacation or is not reachable, they can all push to the main repository, but they're the only people who can, um, who can integrate code into the main repository. We have release maintainers. Um, who are responsible for bug fix releases, which happens, which happen monthly. Um, this is one of my roles at the moment. <laughs> I've been QA for a long time. Now at the moment, I'm a release maintainer for version 16.11. Um, modal maintainers come and go. At the moment, we don't have any. This is people that feel especially responsible for work in a certain modal or want to take care of that. They can sign up and be the main um, person for that. 
Then we have a translation manager, which is an important role with, um, with the many translations we have at the moment. He's responsible for providing the PO files on time so the translators can translate. They're running a web-based translation platform. We use Poodle for that. Then we have documentation team, which is another of my heads at the moment. Um, I share the role with Chris Cormack um, from New Zealand. And he does the more like running the servers and I'm like the communication person trying to get people to write documentation. Um, we have a database documentation manager from India at the moment and we have uh, the quality assurance team, um, which never has enough people. <laughs> and it no, doesn't matter how many there are, we need more of them. Um, it's a wide range of people actually coming from different companies and countries. We have uh, Bywater contributing, we have Biblibre contributing, we have uh, Thicke Solutions from Argentina. Um, I've been quality assurance manager for a long time and it's a never ending task. So those are the very important people. We have a packaging manager who does uh, packages for Debian. So you can just install Koha with one, li uh, one line command mostly. <laughs> Um, we have continuous integration infrastructure maintainer, which is our Jenkins server that is a bit difficult to handle. This uh, server runs automatic tests with every change to the repository. And we have uh, bug wranglers, which is also a good beginner's role. Those are people who focus on testing, cleaning up the bugzilla, bug tracker, taking care things are documented there, that the bugs are, have all the information needed um, for the developers to solve it, um, test bugs uh, that are reported, if they are occurring, in which version they occur and such things. Good. One of my coworkers is uh, there too, Claire Gravely. Okay. Ah, I had animated this, but now we don't need it. <laughs> okay. So um, the first release uh, teams, I think, had a release uh, manager, QA manager. Um, I think that is mostly it and a release maintainer. So they were smaller. We added more roles over time. 2006, 2007, um, more infrastructure mailing lists. I'm right that there's a lot of different mailing lists at the moment. The first uh, Koha uh, conference was held in Paris with the first Techfest as well. And the first time with 122, uh, 120, sorry, attendees. Um, I think from that, the community learned that it is good to meet sometimes. We are very fast spread all over the world, but it's good to get to know each other. It's important that you sometimes see faces and you have beers and food, which is almost more important than the other parts. Um, because it helps the communication in the community. You know who you're talking with. Um, you know how people are. You can work more effectively. And sometimes it's also good to tackle big problems where a lot of people have run into something and no one has quite found the right solution. Um, so the first Hackfest actually resulted in the implementation of the Zebra search engine, which proved to be, it's a piece from index data, uh, Zebra, which we are using. So same. And... Um, there is a lot of documentation, but apparently it's hard to find the bits that you need at the time you need them. I have never tried. Um, and putting all heads together, they managed to do the implementation at this first Hackfest. So this was a big step and um, the core conferences have been a steady thing for a few years now. Um, Next year might go to Portland, as they're the only bidders at the moment. Uh, this year was Philippines. This year before was uh, Thessaloniki in Greece. So it's all we're um, also jumping continents. Every continent um, can get a turn. And if it was on your continent, you have to wait for two more core cons until it can come back. So we're trying to um, give everyone a chance to have one close by. 2008 to 2010 are a bit of difficult years. I usually avoid uh, talking about this time because it's a bit of a touchy subject. Um, Liblime was um, the first US-based Koha support provider, I think. Um, they bought Kartipo's Koha division. So the people working at Kartipo worked then for Liblime and they got the Koha.org domain registered or got a hold of it. 
um, sometime around 2009, I think, which is about the time I got involved with the community, they stopped contributing to core. People just stopped, started to vanish from Baxilla. Patches didn't come in. Um, there was, yeah, it was strange for us. Um, from I remember that there were discussions about it. Some developers left from LibLime and at some point a LibLime Enterprise Koha was announced, which is a hosted uh, version of Koha as the GPL allows you to not um, publish the code if you only have it hosted, which is the kind of problem with GPL in comparison to AGPL licensing. Um, and then PTFS bought LibLime. Um, community and LibLine PDFS never reconciled. There is a bit of bad blood. <laughs> oh, yeah, um, some bad things happened, but consequences um, were that the community lost access to tools and resources as they were run by LibLine. We lost access to the website. We lost access to the domain, the wiki, um, Bugzilla. Um, so what to do? Um, we had a long meeting and we just uh, decided to register a new domain. Um, and rebuild the tools. And one result of this, uh, yeah, this whole problem was that um, now we have split hosting. That so a lot of companies host different parts of our infrastructure. Um, it's not in a central spot, so to say, but with decentral, decentrally organized. So the Bugzilla is hosted by. Bywater, I think the mailing lists are hosted by Biblibre with the main mailing list still hosted by Katipo. So even if one mail server is gone, we can still use the other. So that was the result of that. Um, development continued and I think it motivated people to show that the community version will always be better. It's maybe it's like, okay, it happened. We will go on without um, a former big contributor to the software um, and we'll make it even better. And um, in the spirit, we developed a, uh, or finalized, it was a process to get there, uh, a development workflow that is very focused on QA. <coughs> so when a developer um, publishes code, he sets the status needs sign off, which then triggers the testers to come in. So they need an independent tester. This means um, developer and tester should not be from the same company. If a library um, funds a feature, they can sign off, it's okay, but it should not be a sign off within the company. Um, it can be failed QA and then it goes back to the developer, or it can be signed off. And then the QA team will come in. Um, the independent testers can be libraries, should be libraries, ideally, that just take a look and say, okay, this works as we need it. This feature or this bug fix is working and that's enough. Um, and it looks right and it works in different use cases. That's the important bit about the first step. And the second step, the QA team, they will take the coding guidelines, the style guides um, into account and they will look at the code and look for security problems. That's the job of the QA team. And also they should ask if it makes sense, but um, it, ideally it wouldn't reach QA if it doesn't. If it's past QA, the release manager comes in, they have the last say. Release manager is not a dictator, but they can give it a certain direction to things. Um, or they push to Koha, and then it will be in the next release. So we have three steps of testing, the independent tester, the QA team, and the release manager. And in some cases, QA team will ask for additional um, sign-offs. If it's a huge change in the major model, um, they can ask to have like two more sign-offs. And then once it's integrated, Jenkins does the automated testing. Um, we have, I think, over 50% coverage at the moment as we've made it mandatory to provide tests with the code some time ago. Okay, code quality mostly ensured by coding guidelines, style guides and communications. So you should talk to the developer. You should ask if you don't understand something. You should ask if the preferences are weirdly named. Um, we try to have people do that and encourage um, critical questions. <laughs> Not being mean, but being like constructive, of course. Um, so 2011 to 2016 were a bit busy years, but not so eventful. Um, 
no more major conflicts. Um, we had the first time-based release, which is a late consequence of uh, LibLine 3.2 version. 3.2 version took about two years to get released. It was a feature-based release, so there was a roadmap and every a uh, lot of the vendors and uh, support providers, they put features on the list that they wanted to develop for this version. Um, it turned out that it's very hard if you have a lot of different parties to finish everything on one date, to have it tested, to have it ready for integration. Um, releases had to, had to be postponed in the end, not all features of the roadmap made it in. So as a consequence of that, um, it was decided to switch to another release model a release scheme, which was uh, time-based releases. So we have one major release every six months from then to today. Um, we changed the numbering schema some time ago. So what would have been 3.24 turned out to be 16.5, which is the way Ubuntu, for example, does the numbering. So the first two, bit, two um, digits are the year and the second two are the month. So we'll have 16.5 and 16.11, then 17.5, 17.11. Um, enhancement during this time were a new templating system and a new responsive uh, OPAC theme. There's a lot more, but I have picked those two because it made, they mark major changes that required a lot of coordinating of efforts to make it go in into one, into six months. Um, this is just to show the, the release. So basically time-based means for us what's done on time will be included, what's not done on time won't be. But it means if your feature has been pushed, you can plan for the update. You know, um, if it's pushed now, um, the next release will have my feature and it will happen on a certain date and I can plan for that. So it gives us more, yeah, the option to plan better. Um, bug fix releases, which is my currently job, include releasing a, uh, a little version every uh, every month, <laughs> so you have a continuously um, <laughs> um, trying to find a way to say that um, you can upgrade continuously with one update every month. We don't do that here for our customers. We pick the ones that have interesting bug fixes or we do, of course, security uh, releases. We often jump to major versions or even three that's all possible with Koha. So you don't have to um, do uh, updates very often if you don't want to. The presence. Um, <laughs> at the moment, we think that the community has, consists about like 15,000 libraries. Um, that's take, the number is taken from the number of libraries in Marshall Readings repository, which is I think about 5,000 or more. Um, the fact that every Kohacon we go to, we discover a few hundred more that are not listed. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, there's this project and we run like 200 libraries. So, uh, Turkey runs Koha for all public libraries. Um, Finland has a big uh, Koha project. Libraries in Sweden, like University of Stockholm, University of Lund are adopting Koha. Oslo Public Library, biggest li public library in uh, Norway is running on Koha. So everywhere you go, there is a new Koha. So this is estimates and it's very hard to estimate, but currently we estimate 50,000. We also know there have been like 25,000 downloads of Koha in one year. That I think was a year ago. So we know there's a lot of downloads. Um, we have about like 311 developers uh, total at the moment. Might be missing one, two, three. Um, of those, 95 have been active in the last year which is i think a good number especially since it's very steady so there is not a lot of going up and down that's a number that is uh, is has been on this level for a while now we have about 18 million lines of code <laughs> according to uh, open hub and to get statistics um consisting of like 32,000 comments and uh, a lot of those go to the post process that i've shown earlier and about 40 and some support providers worldwide. I've uh, thought about this slide for a while. Um, government, 
I think it was on the one of the questions Kirsten asked me. It's a bit hard to describe for Koha because um, it works a bit differently than you would suspect. We have the release team, um, which are people who feel responsible for a certain task, um, but they don't make decisions as a uh, as a group. We have mailing lists. All major things are discussed on the mailing list. We have monthly um, general IRC meetings. I have um, put a screenshot of 2007 meetings uh, on the side. So you see we stick to it. It's the first week of every month on Wednesdays. And the time zones um, make us switch the time around a bit. We try to uh, include as many people as possible. Um, we have developer meetings, which are bi-weekly at the moment and they make decisions about additions to the coding guidelines, for example. Um, and we do the occasional online survey, especially for COHA cons, um, as we want to include a lot of people who want to go so they get a chance to vote according to their time zones and to talk to their bosses if they can go and such. That will happen if we get another bid for COHA con <laughs> next year, and it happened in the past when we had multiple bids. So that's about all the structure that we have. Major decisions are made at the IRC meetings, um, discussed previously on the mailing list if it's a controversial one, um, and we try to reach consensus. Um, what the community has is what I call competition. So we have a lot of different support providers and there is commercial interests and they might um, tender in the same FP processes. Um, but inside the community, you seldomly notice um, that there is competition, there is more cooperation. For example, um, I tested a Zoom meeting with, a, with, an <laughs> um, with one of the Bywater people. I just asked, can you check, test this with me before I do this today? And just like, sure. I went to a presentation years ago when I, we didn't have run a test installation with a new version. And I was like, yeah, you can use mine here. I give you access. You get full admin rights. Um, just tell me when you're done and I can, uh, and so I know I can overwrite the version again. So there's a lot of help uh, helping each other out. Um, the most simple thing is a library runs Koha. So Koha is green here and with the K and the library is the L in orange. That is the most simple thing. And sometimes the library might contribute back, they might answer questions on the mailing lists, or they might even have an in-house uh, developer who can contribute code, um, but they don't have to. And of course, the majority of libraries, they just use it. The other very common case is a library contracts with a vendor to um, help them migrate to Koha, to run Koha for them, to provide training. Um, some use uh, service, uh, software as a service models, others run their server in-house. Um, the library might still be contributing back, which is the case for one of our libraries. They have uh, contributed the initial automatic renewal development themselves and still using our software as a service model. Um, it's also happened that libraries contract with multiple uh, vendors to get different services. Um, I was involved in one project where they uh, are contracting for a hosted solution. Uh, with one vendor and as they have uh, branches in different countries, we did the German training, the French uh, company did the uh, training in French and the New Zealand company does overnight uh, emergency server uh, stuff. So three people involved uh, and it makes the end result better. Um, of course, there is the case that multiple library sponsor features, so they pay one uh, support provider or developer to contribute it to the community. Um, Bywater runs a crowdfunding page that's very interesting, whereas you can see the different features suggested and you can pledge money to get it done. Um, we've also helped, uh, yeah, we've for our libraries, it's difficult to write specifications and to contract developers. So we're trying to step in there and help them to, um, to get things developed by writing specifications and outsourcing development as we don't do major developments ourselves. 
Um, then there's the case that one vendor contracts with the other to have developments done. So if one of the vendors is swamped with work and they can't uh, get all the developments done, they might just outsource that to another community member. That's also happened in the past and still happens. We have the case that multiple vendors fund community work. Currently, our release manager is funded by at least three of the companies, I think, which is a pretty new thing to the community, but it works uh, very well so far. Um, we have user groups uh, funding community work, like uh, the French user group or the Italian user group, which is very active. And the Italian user group is also the one that, had, uh, that received the EBSCO funds. So they, they, I think they contacted EBSCO. I wasn't involved really. I know that uh, the funds went through the user group and they contracted people to develop the things they had agreed on. So this is, uh, for the community, it was just another contribution. It wasn't stamped um, as an EBSCO thing in the very clearly to me. Um, but I have seen the, the press release, of course, and uh, I've seen the um, presentations on Coacon. Um, yeah, non Coha companies contribute a fund. I think another example is EBSCO's plugin uh, for the Coha OPEC. So you can integrate the uh, EBSCO index in the OPEC, which was done by, um, oh, I don't know the last name, um, Albert, <laughs> which I have met before. And uh, he does a plugin for Coha. We had under other cases where, like, um, content providers funded developers to uh, integrate their services into Coha. So cover services, things like that, and so on. So there's a lot of connections, a lot of talking uh, between the different parties. Um, and there is not one group or, to dominate. You have to have the help of others to get your things in, which is because of our testing process. If you develop and contribute something, you need some other persons to help you. You need independent testers, you need QA that is independent, so also not the same company as the initial uh, feature. Um, so that helps that um, people have to talk with each other. Um, I've also thought about what, what is the community also about for me, as we don't have so many structures, but there is a, like a common agreement about some values that I think um, the people share. Um, there's one Koha version. We don't have community or enterprise versions. There's one Koha you can download. It has all the features. There's no extras. Um, there are some plugins um, available that you can use, but it's also part of the main thing. We are very international as a community. We have all the nationalities you can think of. We have different cultures, different languages. We live all in different time zones. So this sometimes makes it hard. At the moment, the New Zealand co colleagues, Koha colleagues, I only see like at 10 p.m. at night for me and they go to bed when I wake up and go to work almost. Or it's late evening for them. Um, so you have to think about ways to overcome um, these problems, like switching meeting times around, having two meetings uh, to discuss about an important topic. Um, QA also watches out for, like, um, is everything in dispatch translatable, which is an important thing for us, that um, we don't have regressions on translatability. And it's also written into the coding guidelines. Um, there are still some things to do, like, displaying different monetary formats uh, perfectly. We, we, we can do it, but it's still a bit of work in progress. We have like four different date formats. Um, there's, yeah, a lot to think about. Um, our meetings are always open. They're usually IRC meetings, which helps when you have a lot of language barriers. Reading is easier than contributing in a context like this. Um, the meetings are locked. Uh, the logs are also um, freely available, freely accessible. Um, I think one thing that is also <laughs> um, creates a bit of uh, surprise by people is that we vote per person. So everyone who is present at a meeting has a vote. It doesn't matter if there are like 12 people from one company because it's an individual vote. Um, so they are not members, so to say. We're just individuals when it comes to voting. There is no registered membership model or something like that. 
So you don't pay to be in the Koha community, you just are. You are when you join the mailing list, you are when you run Koha, you are when you're just going to a conference or an event, you are already part of the community. There is no, um, no different levels. Um, and of course, we have a code of conduct for the conferences and where we try to be as inclusive as possible. We had um, the Koha community is, um, there's a lot of, uh, different people there and um, we had we have, have made sure that they had a look at what we've written up there. Um, another big uh, thing is transparency. So um, bug tracker is open. It's sometimes scary how many things there are but it's not that bad actually. <laughs> um, the Git repository is open. The Koha community runs their own Git repository. We have a mirror on GitHub and I think a mirror on GitLab. Um, but we like to run our own uh, tools that are strictly open source and that we can get data out as we please and access to. Um, meeting minutes I have managed, I have C logs as well. So I think one important value is that no decisions are made behind closed doors, um, which also means that sometimes it takes time to reach uh, consensus, um, but it's usually worth the wait. Sometimes it gets a bit hard to sit through a discussion about licensing or um, for spaces or tabs. Developers can get very passionate about stuff like that, but it's also or always worth the wait. So, um, so far so good. I hope you have some questions. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, Katrine. Oh, um, and we'll open it up for questions. That was really helpful um, to to hear about uh, how the QA works and how everybody um, contributes to that. And my question is, can I jump in everybody? I just want to know on the QA, um, when it goes to the libraries it, into the second level, I think it was on your testing, um, is that uh, a group of people at libraries or anyone can jump in at, at, to test it or how does that work? Um, QA is an elected role, okay. um, but everyone can sign up and usually you are voted in if you volunteer. There's, it's not a huge barrier. Okay. You should have some uh, kind of understanding about reading the code, mm -hmm. but I'm not a full-time programmer and I did it for a few years. So having a feeling about this looks not right is already a good start. Um, at the moment, I think we have at least three librarians there. Okay. I think. So um, it is, you should be a bit comfortable about looking at code because this is the more technical part of the testing. But um, for signing off, you don't have to be elected. Everyone can do that. And we have sandboxes um, to invite people to do it without installing anything. We have a Koha dev box set up, which is very easy to install and gives you all the tools as a virtual box thing. So we try to make the first step very, very easy because um, we always need people to do that and help to improve the features because often the feedback is this doesn't work for my library. Can we make it different? Can we make this uh, optional? And this is often a result of the first step of testing. Great. Yeah, that was my question on your slide mm -hmm. about how you went through the process there and and how people get involved on that um, through your process of quality assurance. That's good. I had a related question. Um, it was um, about the independent, independent tester. Um, mm -hmm. How do you define independent? Because you're saying that um, to be a member of COHA, there aren't any fees or registration. Mm -hmm. so I feel like, you know, that it could kind of be anybody. So how do you find independent testers? And As a, uh, independent te just means it's independent from the original developer. So they shouldn't work for the oh, same company. Okay. okay. So that makes like, you have two different parties involved at that step already. And okay. you know that like someone with different eyes looks on it. It's not just that we think people would cheat, but it helps because you get two different perspectives and uh, two different countries maybe looking at it and thinking, oh, that's good. And we're thinking mm, that doesn't work for us because of data privacy reasons. This needs to be optional, which okay. has sometimes happened for us. 
yeah, but really you can jump in today and create a sandbox and sign off a bug and you'll get like a hooray, welcome to the community. <laughs> it's as easy as that, I swear it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so, okay. Uh, later on, I, you mentioned community. Is um, that there weren't any, um, oh gosh, there weren't any community instances. Is that in reference to like consortia or um, those types of organizational? Is this uh, about the voting process or? Um, or about slides? the instances of COHA. Um, I think there was towards the end of your slides. No, let's see. About there isn't an instant for. Um, There's one with the libraries? Yeah. Yeah, a library is very loosely defined here. There could be a consortia as well. Okay. We have, uh, there are no big consortia in Kansas, I think, like uh, Northeast Kansas Library Consortium and some others, <laughs> I think at least four. So this is um, just, this is not a developing company. This is a kind of library in some sense as well. <laughs> because, yeah. I think we would like define us as a vendor in this context, but we're also public institutions, so we're not a, really a vendor. Um, there's a lot of gray areas. Okay. So, uh, so I have a question. Um, this is Kristen from University of Chicago. Uh, I, was, I was interested in that slide that you were talking about earlier about how testing works. And I'm wondering if you if you ended up putting that in place to have like these multiple parties involved sort of as at least a partial result to the, the split with Libline to um, or and I know this is like not your favorite part of your history, but I'm wondering like what what changes did you end up making after that that you feel like were positive for for getting Koha forward and sort of, um, you know, since obviously that wasn't what you were anticipating happening. And I was wondering if this was one of the things that you did. Yeah, this is about the time where I started. So I hope I get it all right. Um, I think what I said earlier, the people felt very motivated. The conflict was bad. Um, it caused a lot of time to discuss things and how to do things and reset up things. But I think the tools we ended up were better than before. Because when you have to start over, usually what happens is that you don't make the same mistakes again. So we switched the wiki from um, DokuWiki to MediaWiki, which is more commonly known. We switched the website from, I think, a, um, a very, it was kind of CMS, but not something widely used to use uh, WordPress at the moment. So we use better tools as a result of that. Um, when people were like, we want to build, we want to prove that the community um, works better than a closed fork. There are still forks and we are friendly with them, like the Turkish uh, libraries, they run a fork, that's not base Koha. And in Finland, there's Koha Somi and there's Koha Kobli in Spain, I think. And forking is not in itself a problem, it's just the way it happens, the very unfriendly way it happens. Um, that resulted in a lot of yeah, bad feelings. Um, um, we learned some things because uh, Lipline PDFs also tried to trademark the word Koha in New Zealand, which was very, very bad. Koha is a word from the Maori language, of the indigenous language of New Zealand. Mm -hmm. It means pr gift and a US company trying to trademark that in New Zealand with only one customer there. Um, it was not nice. And in the end, it had to be, it, got, it, it uh, went to the courts. Um, and um, we HLT won in the end, but it was a close call, and it would have ended and resulted in us having to rename Koha at least in New Zealand, or maybe um, everywhere. So one thing you can learn about it is uh, trademarks don't cost much. You should have them, and you should have them somewhere safe. Um, the European trademark is held now by uh, HLT at the moment. Um, so it was transferred by Biblibre, who had held it earlier and is also a company as a sign of trust. They transferred it to uh, HLT to serve as a, um, as a unit to hold our assets. At the moment, we are still struggling a bit with, uh, with talking about where could funds go to mm -hmm. the community. User groups have acted as, as people to receive funds or as... Um, 
organizational units to be able to receive funds. The community is still a bit mm -hmm. um, undecided about it. You can say how to handle that best. We don't have a lot of um, organization. It's, it's very, it's true. It still works that way. I'm not sure if you can um, use that model for everything, but it, use, it, it works for Koha, which has of course grown from small thing into a very big thing over time. Yeah. Um, other lessons Kat, learned. Kat, yeah. Katrin, it's Kirstin. Um, yeah. can, you, can you outline a little bit this, this uh, process from growing from a very small team what was possible then when Koha was just a very ungrown soft software and when so, so, so describe a little bit the development what's now possible with the matured software so we can learn from that but because at the moment we are still in the very beginning in our process and I think we, we can't just put everything you already have in, in our in our organization. In the very yeah, and I know. Um, what is possible? I think what we have in place, which is good, is things like style guides. We have an idea about how the GUI should look. They mm -hmm. can be innovations. Um, oh, I have an echo now. Do you still hear me well? Yeah. Okay. Yes, I can hear yes. you. Yes. Okay. Um, it's a hard question. You ask hard questions. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> I'll see you in Stuttgart and then we'll pay back. Um, there is like, uh, there is a product. You have an idea how things should work. And I think that helps to, to move forward. And you have like common base to discuss things. You, you have a vocabulary you use. Um, that doesn't mean things can change, but you can say, okay, we have the bootstrap now, we want bootstrap in the staff interface. We want to have, we want to use a new icon set for all our buttons, stuff like that. It's easier if you already have something agreed on and you work from, from that point, I think. Um, it might be easier because you have the workflows, you have like, documentation you can point people to. If someone wants to contribute to Koha, you can point them to the wiki pages. You can say, okay, this is uh, for beginners. Uh, yeah, even mark bugs for beginners. We have academy bugs that are supposed to be left open until one of the new developers comes and takes them. So you have like structures to, to do that. Um, you know, if someone appears and doesn't know where to start, you can point into resources. It's, it's hard to, to grasp for me because when I came in, the product was already very mature. It has changed a lot over time, but it doesn't feel so much like, like changes if you're starting with something that already works quite well. So do, do you know how much, much time it took until the community really, yeah, in a way exploded? And um, so was it like that at the beginning there were a small team and then it growed steadily or was there some tipping point where it says, well, oh, now our product is in a mm. status where a lot more people can join and it makes really sense? Um, I think it was open for contributions from the point where it was released as a version 1.0. At that point, some of the code was still very specific to the, to the original library, of course. And then they started uh, to change it and make it more general and started to, to create the infrastructure as they needed it. So I said earlier, there were two mm -hmm. contributors the first year. I think the next year, the first contributors from non-English speaking countries. And um, mm -hmm. the team, I think, from what I've read, grow kind of slowly at the beginning. We still don't have a very huge um, developer team if you compare it to the number of libraries running Koha. Um, I think at the moment it's mostly a steady number of uh, core developers with occasionally some coming in to fix their problem and then leaving again, which is also fine. It doesn't feel like there was a big explosion, but what we can feel is that all the Koha people seem very busy the last few years. So um, 
companies like Bywater have grown very quickly from the number of staff members. I haven't met them all now. Mm -hmm. It used to be that I know all of them personally. No, I don't. Um, so you see that and uh, there, yeah. Um, that is something that I feel that has happened, but it, I don't, it doesn't feel like a big explosion because maybe it happens in so, so many places on the world that are like, oh, there's something new and there's something new, but it doesn't feel like like a very big thing often. So I, I have a follow-up question with that where, um, you know, like you had said, oh, we have 311 developers, about, you know, 90, was it like 95 of them mm -hmm. are active. Um, how, how do you know who's in the community and what their role is? Like, how can you find that out? Because um, one of the things that, you know, I feel like with the Folio project, as we've grown really fast, um, we're, we're struggling with the best way to communicate so as not to like overwhelm people, but just like if somebody contacts you um, and asks you a question, you're like, oh, well, who is this person and, and what are they doing? So I, you know, like how do you, is there a way that you can get that context so that you can sort of know yeah, of course, we have on the wiki that is the roles that I sh showed you earlier was a screenshot from our wiki. So here's the link to it. Um, so that's the, the official roles, but everyone can answer your question. So the mailing lists are a very important uh, way of to communicate. So everyone can jump in if they feel it's their business. We don't say like, you can't discuss this. You're not in this group. We don't have like uh, interest groups at the moment. It's just if someone starts a discussion, people um, will jump in. It's the same for RSC. Um, so I guess like like how did you how did you come up with your number of having like ninety five active developers? Ah yes, um, as often you have volunteers, mm -hmm. or we want to have volunteers, and we want libraries to contribute. I think it's uh, one of the values that we have tried to f make feel people appreciated. Their contribution should be appreciated. The time someone takes to improve Koha. Um, should lead to some some kind of recognition. So we put everyone who contributed something to a release in the release notes, and we have a history. Um, I'll find a link. This one is the history. So we make sure that people get their spot in a history. And I think it needs an update because it ends here in sometimes 2016. But if you look like for me here, I was developer number 197. This number changed a few times because at the beginning we forgot a few that were before me. So, um, so everyone, this is my team leader actually. <laughs> he was 98. So we try to, um, to show people that their contribution is valued. And as I said, it's a personal one. This is not Bywater or BSZ made the first contribution. It's Katrin and Wolfgang made the first contribution. And it goes on and on and on. <laughs> so I've, in, in order to see how many we have, I just checked here for last one. Ah, uh, yeah. Here, the 311th. So we hope that it's counted correctly because fixing that is always a bit of trouble. <laughs> it's a text file that is just brought to the, to the website. So this is where I took the number. And you can also find out a lot of about uh, contributions from the release notes if you look for them. Do you see the screen actually? I hope you do. Um, yeah. And yeah. there is stuff like OpenHub or GitHub statistics, which also give you a sense um, about people contributing. Oh, and the dashboard, yes. Also a good, um, it shows also how we value the contributions. So you see here like a list of people who signed off did sign-offs in September, passed QA in September, failed QA in September, which is also a contribution, and uh, people who pushed, and we have a statistic over the year, and we try to um, make the people visible that run the project. Katrine, mm -hmm. this, is, this is Debbie from Colorado. So how do you, um, who, who actually has the uh, like the authority to define the roadmap and yeah, we don't have a we don't have a roadmap that's <laughs> one of the things also hard to explain we just don't do roadmaps we have a general idea about what things we want to have like um at the moment we want to have elastic search as another option um so, so you can switch between zebra and elastic search 
Um, we want to have fast circulation. We want to have, oh, my brain is empty. <laughs> yeah, better performance. There are some like community goals kind of everyone agrees to, but it's not like a thing that we sit together and say, okay, this is, comes on a roadmap. It's something like, okay, someone starts it and then we think, yes, we want that. Um, the release managers often will put on a proposal and they will say, I want to focus uh, on those areas for this release, but um, they can't make people do it. They can like encourage it, but um, as we don't can, can tell one developer from one company to work on that and there's different parties. Um, it's not a sad thing. And as I said earlier, what's done um, at the date when we have feature freeze, it's done and will be in and what's not will be not. So sometimes goals take a while to get realized. There's uh, a lot of, yeah. <clears throat> well, just a, a follow-up is, um, has the, the voting where it's just by numbers of people, has that, that is working well, or does that create conflict? It so far, conflict? Uh, <laughs> you, would, you would think it would, but it's so yeah. far it doesn't. It is uh, one of the miracles maybe of core, I don't know, but it's, um, we just all vote like we think is right and it just works and no one. No, because I could, yeah, I could see where, you know, perhaps a bunch of people, uh, protect, perhaps from one library have huge, um, you know, they're really passionate about a particular, so a uh, feature and so mm -hmm. you could load it up and say, well, we'll have all these people participate in this particular voting. And so that's amazing. That's awesome, actually. That, it, like, that's it, what I would have thought would work well. Yeah, maybe it's because we don't vote about money because the community itself oh. doesn't have money. So there is uh, maybe um, less conflict there and we have a QA process. So if uh, any feature goes to the QA process, it's probably not a bad, bad idea if it reaches the end and it goes in. So there is no um, decision beforehand if something is, is worth going in. It's, it depends on the interest people take in it to push it through the process. So as a follow-up, this is Sharon, the, as a follow-up, um, if, if a feature um, like one library, as Deb says, um, is totally committed to something and nobody else voted for it, um, could developers from their institution then just go ahead and push, do that code and then push it to um, the quality assurance or how does that work? Um, what is um, the code that we receive, we don't know beforehand. Often there's a bug file, like an enhancement idea, and seconds later the code is attached to it. There's uh. not always a discussion before. And then it's put to need sign off and then it goes its way. At the moment I need someone to test a specific feature for CAS authentication. And I hope I will find someone, but I know some French libraries who are using this. So I hope uh, if it doesn't move forward, I'll get in touch with the, the colleagues and say, hey, I know you're using this feature as well. Would you like to take a look? This is one way or sometimes people trade a bit. So I have this feature and I know you don't, not not everyone likes it, but I will sign off and test yours if you take a look at mine. So there can be a bit of negotiating if uh, something is very odd. But we often we think some feature is odd and then like, oh, we are using this as well. And from the other side of the globe, it's like, oh yeah, we know that as well. We have like a discharge process. Uh, in German, it's Entlastung, where before you leave the university, you have, uh, you, before you get your diploma, you have to get some kind of paper from the library that you have returned all the books and which, uh, that there are no open fines. So they can request that in the OPEC. Um, and then they, if everything is okay, they can download a PDF and use that. And at the beginning, this I think was a French development and I knew we had it, but also Argentina does it. And so sometimes things that seem like a weird process um, turn out it's not so weird as you thought. As then you thought. Um, I think the only really bad idea I've seen so far was one library wanted to store the passwords and clear text again, so they could tell the, the patrons what the password was. And I think this is the only <laughs> feature I've ever seen that was collectively. Um, 
yeah, we we didn't uh, realize that one. But uh, so far, everything like so it's negotiating. Um, sometimes, if it's too specific, you say, okay, maybe this could be a plugin, or this needs to be a switch, or you always find the middle ground so far, and you almost always find enough uh, people who want it. Excellent. Adrian, isn't it also the case that because in those instances where like a vendor might sponsor some development and but the actual instance of Koha is locally supported or supported by a service provider that the um, library or institution can deploy it in a customized way so they don't have to use enhancements or parts of the development that might have been pushed through by others? Does that make sense? I hope I understood correctly. <laughs> we'll see. Um, um, Koha is open source and if you run it locally or you have a vendor who's willing to, um, you could put in your own code anytime. You can like, you could pay someone to make customizations for us, for you, that uh, are not given back to community, but it always bites you in the end. Because the more you change to your Koha version, the harder it will get to update to the next version. Mm -hmm. And the more expensive it will get because you will have to pay the vendor again to make it work again with the newer code mm -hmm. as things change around. So um, a lot of libraries have gone down this path. We have avoided it due to um experience i'd say <laughs> so we have a few very very german things in our koha version that we run that are just not common enough like certain 19 customized uh, mark fields that we have indexed like nine xx fields so we have some additional indexes we have a few changes to the xslt but um, in general everything bigger we never run only on our version. We always want to come to it to be in the major version because that's the only way you can keep it safe. It also means once it's in the major version, now no one else can is allowed to break it. It sometimes happens, but I should fix it again. So okay. you don't have to pay for maintenance. It, you can do it. People do it a lot, but it's not recommended on a certain scale to okay. run. Yeah. Thank you. So one last question I have is when it sounds so good on your mailing list that you can discuss, get consensus, does anything after go back to the IRC meeting to discuss or make sure consensus happens? How does that work in conjunction with your mailing list? If there is a bigger, more controversial topic, it might go like both ways. It it's discussed in the RSC meeting and you see, okay, that's, we can't solve that here now. So please continue on the mailing list and then it gets put back on the agenda and until some point where you feel like you can have a vote on it okay. and then it will happen. So it's a back and forth between the mailing lists. And I've, I've got a question. Um, Koha has libraries all over the earth, every time zone. I'm sure is included. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I guess one of the things I've been really interested in is how Koha as a community is actually able to communicate and have discussions across all those different time zones. Because I think it's one of the things we're struggling with now as a project. Mm -hmm. And for instance, we know for a fact we have library organizations and libraries themselves that would like to get involved that frankly are in time zones right now that are just completely difficult <laughs> for us to work with. Yeah, and how, and how does that work? Yeah, when I was a QA manager, I once tried to have a meeting for the QA team and it was impossible yeah. because once we there are tools online where you can put in your times when it's good, and there was no overlap, no, none at all. So you go back to mailing lists actually you you start discussions by email which not on the same time or you if you're lucky you can meet in person sometime it is right. it makes things harder if you're spread out but it also gives you more prospects perspectives more experiences it's pro and so, cons so in thinking about this then how much actual communication occurs let's say like this 
in a conference call versus using other tools that don't mm. require someone being in the same time zone? We don't do, usually do conference calls at all. Okay. Um, we don't do video conferencing as a community. There are sometimes if people want to work on a certain topic, they have like used Google Hangout, but it's not, an, not a community meeting in itself. Like people interested in REST API, sometimes that I know, but it is not a common thing. Um, as I said, we use a lot of IRC still because it's a very low barrier. Mm -hmm. It works from a phone. It works if you can't talk the language so well. It works if people can't understand you so well. And you can read back if it's not your speed. Mm -hmm. um, it's sometimes easier, I think. That's one reason why we still stuck to, to stick to the a bit older technology. Thank you. Yeah. So, okay, Katrine, one more thing. So it sounds like the community grew pretty quickly organically, sort of. Um, I was wondering, did you all make any, um, you know, as far as getting the word out about Koha, did you do, did the community do any active, hey, everybody, let's go to all these conferences and let everybody know about <laughs> Koha, and that contributed, you think, to the growth of the community, or is it just, yeah. hey, I heard about this, and this is awesome, and um, yeah, I wasn't there at the time. Um, how we learned about it was like we were actively looking for open source uh, alternatives. Um, then Koha in 2008 pretty much came up immediately if you looked for open source ILS. Um, I actually don't know if there was a lot of marketing. I think they did their share of talking at conferences. Mm -hmm. um, they won a 3M award at some point for Koha. Um, there were some articles. Um, it is actually part of the history. That's why I know it. It's listed in the, the chronic, uh, chronic uh, showed earlier. Um, I think at some point it's like snowballing. Like there is this library in my neighborhood using Koha. This is cool. Let me, I want that too. And um, in the beginning here in Germany, people didn't know what Koha was. I started all with talking at conferences and now we are slowly at the point where when you say Koha, people know it's a library system um, and takes a while. But I think there have been a lot of um, people in different countries working on that. So, I think I was actually a, a small part of that of that process. I'm, I'm Sebastian with Index Data. I, I, the well, first time we ever did uh, ALA, as a company, I, I ran into Josh Ferraro at mm -hmm. Libline, and he had a table mm -hmm. down in the back end, and that was his first his first ALA as well. And I think the next few years, we actually uh, pooled our resources and got a booth together. <laughs> and so that was 2004 and five, and before that, I don't know that there really were any commercial entities anywhere that that were sort of pushing or, or getting behind Koha uh, the I, way that I think Biblibre might be the same age mm. or even older I don't know but there's some companies I think around the same time maybe yeah, yeah. but in different countries so it starts, starts small somewhere yeah. yeah but there was a long I mean before that I think we the first time I sort of installed Koha must have been one of the very early versions and it must have been mm -hmm. it must have been I think 10 years before that uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe eight years before that it's it it there was a long period of fairly slow growth after the mm -hmm. initial version of the code right yeah I think so I think one major tipping point was uh, the mark uh, standards when they got introduced into Koha, it got mm -hmm. interesting for a lot more libraries. So there are right. certain certain spots in history that are more interesting. And the other, of course, Zebra. Having the search engine before, before a lot of other ILS that use search uh, technology to provide search was, I think, another big, big step forward. Yep. And I still like Zebra. <laughs> I'm I'm curious if if Elasticsearch will live up to it, but um, I'm I'm watching <laughs> to try it out. <laughs> well, I think uh, it's uh, Zebra at this point is showing its age. It's somewhere near 20 years old as well. So I I'm, I'm, I, I I was part of encouraging the community to move on because we, we were in all of our projects mm -hmm. at that point. But Zebra is still it's very good at Mark, but but um, yeah. it's been surpassed by Elasticsearch and and Solar. I think that's the main point that it's uh, very Mark. Uh, 
very Mark. <laughs> very much so. It's born around it's born around library standards. Yeah. Yeah, and we want to move forward and and enable features that are not so Mark driven. Totally. Any other questions, Katrine? Well, thank you so much um, for okay. this great overview and, and sharing all your tools and showing your dashboard. That's really nice to see. Um, Do you want to have the slides? Should I send them to you? Yes, that would be wonderful. And I could put that on our wiki resources. Yeah, that would be great. Okay. Uh, I'll make sure I have put some links on the end. I'll make sure to put on some, some more that relate to the things I've said. That would be great. And thanks for the links in that your your overview too. That will help us tremendously. Okay. I hope you uh, it will help you to discuss and, and find a way to how you want to do things. Exactly. And and as we said, we are dis, um, discussing how to do time zones. So that was very interesting. So thank you. Thanks again. All right. Um, how, how do okay. I get back the screen? Oh, um, <laughs> just stop sharing there. It uh, should. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, there you go. Thanks. Okay, everybody, um, let's try to wrap up our few other um, items on our agenda here. Uh, I hope everyone got to read Holly's uh, project report, and I wondered if there's any questions for any of the teams, uh, SIG teams, um, from that project report. If not, um, I'd like to um, raise a concern that came up, um, and that is uh, how the SIG groups are going to work with um, some contracted developers and people who are needing feedback from the SIGs and how that's going to work with our version one priorities. You see this statement under my SIG liaisons. And one example of this came from Kristen Martin. Um, there are other examples, but Kristen Martin um, brought forth to us that um, the front side group who's um, building um, some of the connections uh, from a knowledge base for RM wanted um, some feedback from the RM SIG and First of all, Kristen wasn't quite sure who, you know, who the people were, so we had to um, figure that out. And then that needed help, and then it raises the bigger issue of, of um, how do we fit this into our regular meetings and how the SIG conveners can work with um, uh, feedback that's needed from um, other developers. So I throw that out there. Kristen, do you want to add anything else um, to um, your? Yeah, well, I was thinking about this and like in some cases, I feel like it goes back to what we were trying to do with Peter for just like who is who and what are they doing? Um, because, you know, I missed the product council meeting when um, the front side people came and introduced themselves. And while I read the minutes, I just, um, you know, it was in, I, it, didn't, it didn't stick with me. And so then there was terminology that I wasn't familiar with. I didn't know how this was fitting in with the project as a whole. And so I, I just felt kind of like uninformed. <laughs> and here I was supposed to be like leading the thing. And I was, um, so, I, um, I, I, I feel like, like maybe, I still feel like there should be some sort of a, a central place where we could just have some general information about, hey, this is what's going on in the project and this is who is working on what. Even though I know that changes rapidly, I, I, you know, there's so many different developers and different teams and we really have to build up quickly. Like some of it is just, you know, not necessarily like we have to actively um, tell each other what we're doing all the time, but just so that if something comes up, I can be like, oh, I know I can look right over here. And it will tell me like what I need to know so that I can get myself up to speed if I've missed something. Um, 
So I, I guess that's something that I'm still thinking about. And, and even like, like a, re, not quite to the same scale, but related, you know, I'm talking to stacks about um, what they want to do for the agenda. And they're throwing out names of people that I've never heard of before. <laughs> so that I'm like, who is this? They're not on the wiki. Or if the people are on the wiki, there's no information about who they are. You know, like that was one of the things we said we'd do was we'd give a little bit of information on our profiles at least so that um, we kind of know like, oh, this is their role and this is what they're working on. And, um, and so that information wasn't there. And then, you know, I find out like, oh, well, you know, Leah Elzinga is no longer going to be working on the project. And so, you know, this other person, Dennis, has replaced her, which is fine. But I, um, I feel like I'm finding out about these things kind of haphazardly and um and it's just uh, it, it's adding to a certain level of like confusion, and that may just be on my part. But since we do have a lot of different development teams that have been working with the resource management SIG, I want to help make sure that when people are coming to meetings, they know who people are and what they're doing, and um, you know where they should be focusing their efforts. So I think we should go ahead and make that page. Well, we do have a profile page. It's just that certain people, like developers and some others, haven't been put in there and we have to put yeah. our roles in there right Kristen we haven't mm -hmm. put all our roles in there yeah I mean people have to like individuals have to take some onus to do some of that but even like Harry I was thinking at one point when you shared with us the v1 spreadsheet you right. kind of had like, these are the teams and their product owners and then you said well this is really tentative so you didn't want to leave it in there but right. um, like having that level would be helpful too so because um, I feel like some of it was just like terminology. I was like, is the Austin development team front side? Like I, I didn't connect the two, <laughs> um, you know, I've been so calling it front side in my mind, but, um, but then they were calling themselves Austin. And so that was just, um, just to be able to clarify that. So I'm happy to go back and update all that information in the spreadsheet and add a column for that. If, you know, I think the PC thinks that would be useful and I have to be honest, I didn't know we had a profile page and that's my ignorance right there, but um, I'm also happy to go in and update that as well. Yeah. Well, it's just when you're, when you're on the wiki, you know, you have to create a login. Mm -hmm. So, and it's, it's really um, like here, I'll just show mine. If I can. Hmm. Um, Okay, so there's not a whole lot of information on here, but it, it just kind of lists like, you know, who I am, what my job is, and what my participation is. Is so, there another, uh, is there another the level to this? Page, I'm, I'm, some of it could also be updating that or putting more people on that, uh, or maybe just listing the organizations at least with some links. We also have some flexibility on this profile page to put other data elements there um, if, if there's something missing and if there's something that would be useful uh, for people to know. Although I, I like the way Koha had that page organized by role. I think that would be yeah. pretty mm -hmm. slick to have. We and, really helped too. On this profile page, is there another level above this, like a directory or something of some kind, or? The people. Yep. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. So. Am I on um, here? <laughs> yeah. It should be. You have a wiki yeah, account. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. I think. Yeah. If you have, if you've got a wiki, uh, it's kind of broken up on here, but and I, it's you I know, of course, it's alphabetized by first name. So yeah. You're actually twice. Um, what a picture and everything. I had no yeah. idea. That's a terrible but, picture. You know, there's not a whole lot of information. <laughs> so, like, if I didn't know you and you contacted me, I might be like, oh, and, and you know, it just helps. Just because there are a lot of people that are involved in the project, it just helps to know, like, oh, okay, this is the role. But for this, but, but but I on this I'm sorry, go ahead, Chris, uh, Kirsten. No, no, I interrupted you. Please go on. <laughs> so, um, to be on this page, though, you have to have an account on Confluence, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that's a problem. And should we go ahead and create a page? Because I guess my question is, how do we force everyone to have an account so they appear on this? 
Well, is there anyone who's contributing yeah. significantly to the project who would not have a Confluence account at this point? Yeah, that would be bad if they didn't. Yeah, um, I mean, there's so, much, so many resources that we maintain there. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you don't have to have an account to browse any of this. So you right. can go through and use the entire wiki site gathering useful information, following links, but that doesn't mean you have to have an account. But isn't it the same it, login as, uh, as Jira? Jira, yeah, that's what yeah. I was wondering, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah right. I think it, it would be helpful if we had on the wiki somewhere, like who the development teams are and who the people are on the development team. Yeah, that would um, be good. And, and and maybe what the projects are that they're working on. I, what I what I, really, what I really liked um, here uh, what 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 Katrin just told us. I think one thing is the profiles of uh, the people who are a little bit more involved in Folio than just looking in the wiki. That's one thing that it's absolutely helpful to have a full profile for everybody. Probably we can. Uh, a point to that in that introductory uh, paper we, we wrote one time and which is on the first side, I think, when you're entering the wiki. Uh, but the other thing is, like it's uh, divided into releases and at the moment we are still working on release one. <laughs> so we just have one release, who's doing what in this release and probably who's doing what in the next release. That is so helpful. That is really, really helpful. I like that a lot. What, what, what? Uh, because not everybody who's in that uh, present in that profiles already has a, an important or role in every release that can change hopefully over the years. But it's it's important to know what at the recent time is happening, who is doing yeah. what. <laughs> Well, I think some of that we get a little bit from uh, from Kate's report, mm -hmm. uh, but just having like a having a place, I, I feel like um, I feel like the information is usually there somewhere, but it's not necessarily that easy to piece it together if it's in you know meeting minutes in one place or another. Right. Yes. A collective Can place. Go ahead, Martina. Can we add a little overview, a little list of our um, product owners? Because I'm still a little bit confused who's doing what, because the, the number of product owners is growing, right? Mm -hmm. So, so that, that's where I was hoping if we had a page that we could list by role, um, I think it'd be useful to have that as sort of a general index. Can't we add such a page to the roadmap? And at the moment, we we still have a roadmap, <laughs> in in uh, other than Koha, but so we can have a, the roadmap, and from the roadmap, an extra page. That's what's happening at the moment. Who's doing what? Is someone able to set that up? We can we can set that up. It's just I guess a little bit odd because the roadmap is a spreadsheet. Um, but it has a wiki site, hasn't it? Where we can. No. Really, no, no. or there was, there oh, was sort of a really high, high, high level overall plan, yeah. but nothing I think that went into any kind of detail like the spreadsheet does. Well, the development and milestones are linked to on the wiki. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, this is, I'll just uh, show you what, what's out there. So. We do have this information. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's from the wiki. So we could put it up there. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and like I'm not, you know, like even, so I just, this is right here on the main page. Like I'm not even sure who is kind of the product owner for um, for the acquisitions work. Um, there's some, I mean, there's some, some names listed on dev.folio.org under community as well. Would, would, would that be a place where something like that could live? Or we should at least consolidate these two things. Mm -hmm. That'd be great. Yeah. I think it would be a good idea that this occurs probably under or over the folio roadmap as a big point in on the on the introduction side. That would be good. Mm -hmm. Folio roadmap, that's the content where we are working on and who's doing mm -hmm. what at the moment. 
and and if it's done on the dev side um, where it's, it's it's maintained we can have a link so link out to them yeah yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So just done that just done once that's right that's good do, do you all yeah. think that it would be helpful um, I think Kristen had mentioned that the example with uh, stacks and stacks is a they're a third part are they a third party group right okay and so not knowing who those people were and somebody had mentioned that that it might be helpful okay, so Harry you mentioned the role title the role sorry the role and then would organization be helpful at all too so for instance when you go to the people directory um, I, I find myself wanting to do things like oh I wish I could pull up an organization maybe like stacks because I met these perhaps meetings where I hear a name and I know there was stacks but I can't remember who they are so I'm just wondering first of all uh, would there be uh, would that be useful to people um, and then I suppose, you know, how easy would it be to, to do that? I think of role might be helpful, like product owners who are the product owners of, of, yeah, of, well, of this area. And yeah. So right now it's, it's put very in a role that you can add to your own profile. Mm -hmm. Right now it's very so, limited what you can put in on your own profile. That's why there's so little there. Yeah. And um, what about, be, um, um, Peter, would beyond you like the profile again I really kind of liked what we saw on Koha where there's literally that chart broken down by role <coughs> on the project mm -hmm. and then having the list of people that have taken on that role I think Absolutely. that would be a really nice and easy way to navigate <coughs> through all of this and and maybe one way we can do that is as the developers are meeting face to face and maybe hopefully we can pull together the product owners, working with what developers work, and we could do that. And they could help us start building that page um, since they're meeting um, coming up face to face and we could put that on. I'd love to continue this discussion. This is really good discussion about where our information be. How do we make our information um, available to everyone on this wiki um, with our conveners next week they're coming to the meeting um, hopefully most of the SIG conveners can make it and uh, ask for their input too because I know the RA SIG also had people attending last week and they were asking me who's this person who 